Hi, thank you very much um, to the previous presenters. It's been great uh, hearing how the conversation is flowing. We will now enter um, our third session. Um, that has got um, four presentations. We're going to get started um, with uh, Rex, technology-based industrialization. I mean, the balance of payment constraints in African countries, evidence from Morocco and Tunisia. Uh, similar to the previous sessions, let's throw in the questions as we go. Uh, otherwise, at the end, then we will uh, collaborate on a couple of uh, of the questions. Uh, Rex, over to you. Uh, thanks, Danny. Um and uh, greetings to everyone. Um, Rosal, if you could uh, help me put up my slides. Thank you so much. Um, so this paper um, emerged out of the um, uh, um, interest I had in, in understanding how balance of payments constraints um, contribute to um, a country's pursuit of uh, industrialization. And um, this, this, um, this level of thinking you so, sort of emerged from an understanding in the literature about um, um, first appreciating the relevance of the structural change and why that matters for industrialization, but um, also realizing that uh, emerging studies at the time were now talking about technology-based manufacturing um, and how that is, that is relevant for um, <clears throat> development and catch up um, currently. Next slide, please. All right. So even though you know countries um, currently the debate around um, technology based industrialization is uh, you know being pushed developing countries um, you know struggle with balance of payment constraints and that is a significant uh, can be a significant strain to uh, countries uh, pursuits of uh, industrialization um in the literature the balance of payment constraint growth model um you know is is, is well documented it traces back to um uh, Professor Tewa, who is a legend uh, two popular versions of this model, um, which is multi-sectoral uh, to sort of uh, understand um, the extent of the balance of payment constraints uh, while looking at the technology-based uh, sectors that uh, um, uh, the country of interest as you next okay um so the simple and the simple and multi sector uh, balancing models are quite similar but they present two sides uh, of our key message that is you know a country might choose a country that, that uh, chooses um it to grow its economy must be able to uh, must be in a position where its uh, uh, income elasticity of demand for exports is higher relative to while keeping its uh, income elasticity of demand for imports uh, as low as possible. What the multi-sectoral uh, version does is to introduce sectoral shares to represent the, the structure of the economy and make it a bit more interesting. Um, sorry, okay, let me turn this up. Um, I hope this is better. So the, the multi-sectoral model uh, sort of introduces uh, sectoral shares um, to sort of capture the, the the structure of the economy in a sense. Next slide, next slide, please. So what we do in this paper is to estimate both versions of the model for Morocco and and Tunisia. Um, next slide, please. Morocco and Tunisia are considered because of their close proximity to markets in in Europe and Asia. Right. And in that sense, being close, they're able to, you know, benefit from knowledge and spillover gains. But it also means that they benefit from, you know, uh, having uh, easy access to to markets in developed countries where they can trade um, in in essential uh, commodities and, and goods. Next slide, please. All right, so the next two slides talk about the contribution, but I think I want to move on to the data section. So let's skip. Um... All right, now briefly, I 
just to talk about the two sort of models you see here that this is the the the, the simplest the simple version of the model um and in the next two slides we will see the the multi-sectoral version which takes the the simple version and in the structure of the economy that's on the next slide please Yes. So basically, in, in equation one and equation two is, is what we estimate. Um, <clears throat> but the key caveat here is um, these elasticities that contribute to this model are long term elasticities of the income, uh, long term income elasticities of demand for exports and uh, imports. And to do that, one would need to generally use some kind of uh, time series error correction method that you know, uh, controls for you know, uh, the structure and other you know, structural breaks um, <clears throat> for each economy in order to obtain the elasticities that will fit, will then fit in this model um, to predict the, the long-term growth. So let's move to the data section. Next one, please. Next one. All right, so we, in order to estimate the two models, we use data mainly from the, no, let's go back to the previous one. Oh no, okay, it's fine. No, please, let, let's go back to that, the next one, the one with the table. All right, it's fine, let, let me start from here. Yes, okay, it's fine. Let me start from here. So this is a summary definition of variables that um, <clears throat> that we adopt in the course of trying to estimate um, equations that will give us the income elasticity of demand for exports and imports. Um, and these are sourced mainly from the um, UN Comtrade data, um, as well as the Penn World Tables and the, the World Development uh, Indicators. And the understanding is that um, for the different classifications or, or technology-based uh, trade data, um, <clears throat> each one, each sector would then give us a, an income elasticity of demand for exports or imports that will, will fit in, uh, that will fit in, in each of the versions of the model um, that we use. Next slide, please. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Next one, please. Okay, so beginning from this uh, table, this is basically a representation of the estimated um, uh, long run equations that give us the income elasticities of uh, demand for exports in the case of Morocco. Um, and there are other tables in the next two or three slides that show that for Tunisia and uh, as well. Um, but if we move on, maybe two or three slides, we can see a summary of all of these um, income elasticities um, and how these, how these uh, specific estimates go into the, the model. So uh, let's move on, please. Next one, please. Next one. Next one, please. Right, and let's go to the next one. Okay, so what this table basically shows is uh, using the, um, the estimates obtained from the error correction models that were estimated, we we do see that uh, the predicted growth from the model to the actual average growth rates, there is some kind of uh, closeness, they're close enough. And on that basis, um, the model becomes sort of valid for uh, for drawing policy inference. And then for, you know, for being able to tell um, which sectors that a country should direct its resources to. Um, that is 
sectors who sectors that have higher import elast income elasticity of uh, demand for exports uh, would have higher you know should be high and then those that and the sectors that have a lower income elasticity of demand for imports are those that should be focused on. Um, so let's move to the next slide, please, for the policy inferences. Um, going on from from that point, what we did what we did discover is that um, there are different sort of policy recommendations for. Um, <clears throat> There are different sort of policy uh, prescriptions for each of the countries. While Morocco should uh, focus on, uh, sorry, while Tunisia should focus on uh, uh, high tech exports, uh, for instance, um, we realized that the income elasticity of demand for imports was uh, pointing to a much another uh, sector, I think it's resource based or something like that. And in the case of um, Morocco, um, their income elasticity of demand for 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 exports, um, for the high tech manufacturing was not significant, as so they therefore they could not focus on that. Um, okay, now that is back up. Uh, can we move on to the next two or three slides, please? So, um, based on the income elasticities of uh, demand um, for exports and imports in 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 both for both countries, uh, the policy prescription from the model is for. Morocco to shift to uh, medium term exports and high tech um, imports. And that's generally because of the, the higher income elasticity of demand for the exports and then the lower income elasticity of demand for, for the imports. Um, <clears throat> and in the case of Tunisia, there is also, next slide, please. Yes, so in the case of Tunisia, they would focus on high tech um, exports and resource based uh, imports. And that's because the income elasticity of demand for exports for Tunisia's high tech uh, uh, manufacturing sector is uh, statistically significant, right? So, if the direct resources in there, the idea is that they're they able to make um, significant gains and, and, and grow in the, in the long term, right? <clears throat> However, based on the results, next slide, please. Based on the results, we also find out that um, resource-based uh, trade uh, manufacturing um, also had some uh, some um, some interesting uh, estimates. That is, for resource-based trade, the um, income elasticity of demand for exports seemed higher. Um, and the, the income elasticity of demand for, for imports seemed uh, lower. And that, that we feel is, um, is, is also an interesting opportunity for, for, for these countries to also explore because of um, literature pointing to the fact that um, um, <clears throat> resource-based uh, trade and manufacturing also exhibits uh, similar properties um, as we know uh, in, uh, of, of the manufacturing sector. Um, so to conclude, um, the study finds that uh, both of the models predict well um, <clears throat> and that there's scope for structural change in, in either countries. But overall, the model um, points to the importance of the export-led growth part um, and, and that is that, that ma making it still relevant for, for African countries. Other countries may consider this part, um, but, you know, if... The, the whole study is subject to data availability. So with, with better data, we probably could have estimated the these models for for other African countries. But most importantly, the um the the, the main message is that the pursuing industrialization or some kind of uh, export led growth um might be challenged because of um, uh, balance of payment constraints that African countries are, are facing currently. That makes it difficult for them to to catch up uh you know reasonably and that is something that policymakers will want to get a hold of um once they have been able to identify the particular sectors that that have the uh, significant uh, that have a uh, uh, high income elasticities of the demand for exports um in, in their economies all right uh, i'll end it here thank you so much all right thanks uh, thank Rex. Right. Yeah, thanks for the next presentation.
is on structured labor and structured labor market variants and implication for industrial development uh, by Cheryl Lin. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Go it's ahead. more like the afternoon and I'm just setting my timer so I can keep myself true to time. All right. You've so, got 12 minutes to the thought. Thank you. So the title for this paper has changed a little bit, uh, but the content is very much the same. Um, I looked at a gendered analysis of labor market outcomes in South Africa over the COVID period and chose to focus on the quarterly labor force survey and then to begin a broad exploratory discussion about the policy implications. Some of the findings uh, weren't, weren't that surprising. And so a focus to use the quarterly labor force survey data. Uh, you may remember that at the beginning of COVID, it was the NIDS-CRAM data set that was most quickly available. And so a lot of the research and the policy decisions relied quite heavily on NIDS-CRAM. Um, and eventually the quarterly labor force survey data was available. And I was looking at whether or not there were differences in the outcomes of uh, labor market findings using using the labor force survey data in comparison to its cram. Um, so what I did was provided a detailed examination of uh, what was described as gendered patterns of unequal labor force participation. So this is not new, um, but in COVID we had a deepening um, and the question was what happened with the shock uh, and what can we learn from it? We found, as did the NITS CRAM study, that women were harder hit by the crisis than men. This is different from the global financial crisis where men were hit hardest. Uh, we also found that employment losses for men and women have yet to recover. And so sometimes I will hear in the press that uh, we have recovered from COVID. The data doesn't bear this out. And we also found that employment losses for women were not fully explained by sectoral, occupational or industry sorting. Um, and then next slide, we moved to incorporate a historical approach to contextualize the data. Um, and this provided a very different view to what we had intended to look at. So um, you'll eventually see some slides that have got data back to 2008. Um, but when interpreting the data, we were able to offer a wider perspective that suggested a pre-existing set of labor market structural features that were situated within a distribution of power and political architecture, um, and to also identify that these forces continue to shape differential outcomes associated with gender and race groupings. Sums up to say uh, labor market responses to COVID were not independent outcomes. Um, and essentially, we have pre-1994 features that uh, still perpetuate in the labor market today. In terms of methodology and data, this was a, a simple descriptive um, study. And I incorporated mapping trends, distributions of the labor market uh, based on employment status, including labor force withdrawal, employment at the inter intensive and extensive margin. Um, sector occupation industry analysis, uh, we looked at 13 waves. The base year was, sorry, the base quarter was quarter four, 2019. Um, and the end, the end line was quarter four, 2022. And we supplemented this data with a selection of available um, historical economic data, um, sorry, employment data. You might uh, remember that before 1994, there was a limited amount of employment data for everybody in the economy available. And so it was only from 1994 that everyone was counted. Um, and we were able to zoom in on granular data. Uh, details for periods um, starting Q1 20, 2008. Um, so in terms of findings, the slide that you're seeing there now is focused on the COVID period. Uh, the very first quarter um, is, at the, is on the leftmost point. Uh, the hardest level of lockdown is depicted by the two bars that drop straight down. And so orange is women, blue is men. And we see that in that first quarter with level five lockdown, women were hit harder than men. Quarter on quarter, the picture changes. Um, women remain lagging behind. In some quarters, they pick up the pace. But by the end line, um, you still see that at the end of 2022, both men and women are still be, uh, behind pre-COVID um, employment um, levels, and women are slightly further behind than men. So the gap is closed by that point, um, but women are certainly still on the back foot and neither men or women have recovered. Next slide, please. 
Um, here we see not economically active um, trajectory over that same period. And so the blue line at the bottom is men, uh, women at the top. So we see that women are located very clearly um, for the entire period above men, but it isn't just limited to the COVID period. Uh, this is a feature of uh, women's participation in the labor market. Um, and so we'll see that in a little bit more contextual detail later. Next slide, please. Okay, um, I hope you can see this in detail, but what you're looking at there is labor force composition focused on women. Um, we'll see men in a second. I'd like you to focus on the second and third bars in color. They are the red bar um, and the dark green bar that crisscross each other. The red bar is labor force participation. The green bar is those who are not economically active, which is to say that over the period 2008, all the way through to the end of the analysis period, end of 2022, women crisscross in and out of labor force participation. Um, and so when you look at COVID, which is the uh, sharp the sharp gap um, in 2020, that was uh, Q2 2020, uh, you'll see a heightened difference between the labor force participation rate um, and not e economically active. But if you take a look at the quarters before that, on a smaller scale, you have this crisscrossing and women are structurally located um, half, half or 50% more often than men outside of the labor force. Um, and that was a feature that we didn't go into look for, but found and, and found it quite interesting. If you contrast this with the next slide um, and you look at men, so looking again at that red bar and the dark green bar, there is a substantial gap between the two all the way along the analysis period. But in addition to that, at the worst part of COVID, those, uh, those two points don't overlap. Um, and so this led us to, again, um, deepen our understanding of the fact that men versus women are in a far more secure place in terms of labor force participation, and even something on the scale of COVID, a global uh, phenomenon, did not unseat fundamentally men's preference in the labor market. Uh, next slide, please. Here, if we take a look at the same set of questions, the colors change, but now we're disaggregating by race. Black African people, um, here, the red bar is, is also still labor force participation, but it's the light blue bar um, that represents not economically active. Here, the two lines travel closely together. At the worst part of COVID, they overlap. Um, and so you see that there is precarity built into the labor force based on classification as black African person. If you take a look at the next slide, here we're looking at colored people. The gap between the two lines is wider. They touch briefly, they, they overlap if you zoom in on the date of colored people. And so there was certainly precarity and, and they took a hit uh, during the COVID period. But you see comparatively more stability for the colored population in terms of uh, their place in the labor force. Next slide, please. This is for the Indian population, uh, Indian Asian classification. Again, there is a, a relatively wide and a steady gap between the red and the light blue lines, uh, which is to say even at the worst part of COVID, the Indian or Asian population were not nearly as affected comparatively as black African people were in terms of labor force participation. Uh, so they were, and you can see a, a lagged overlap um, with the light green line and the light blue line. And that is not the worst part of COVID, that is the July 2021 riots um, that, uh, that impacted the the uh, Asian Indian population. Next slide, please. Here we see the white subset of the population. And unlike the other three slides that we've seen before, the working age population of white people is declining over time. And that's the, the case uh, since 20, 2008. Um, but you see here that there is very little difference between labor force participation um, and the employment rate. So that's the light green line. There's a significant gap between both the red and light green lines and the blue line, which is to say uh, that structurally there is a very favored position that white people enjoy in terms of stability in the labor force um, and being able to participate as an employed person rather than as an unemployed person. Um, and so because these features were not just about COVID, but they were historical. Uh, it really just reinforced the, the reality that 
as a country, South Africa is not in a similar position to developed economies like the United States, for instance, where a black woman is part of a relatively very small minority. Um, and you have a large majority that is in employment that is stable um, and located inside employment as opposed to on the margins of employment. In South Africa, it's the majority 30 years into democracy that are still structurally located on the edges of employment. Next slide, please. So in terms of insights, uh, what are some of the summary points? That black women are a reserve army of labor, that they are essentially economic shock absorbers. When there's any kind of um, economic shock, it's black women who get spat out of the labor market before other subsets. Women are characterized by greater labor mar market precarity. Um, and this was amplified during the COVID period. Um, labor market positions become more deeply entrenched over time. Um, and we see that this is not bouncing back, even when we update the data set with the last year's worth of data. Next slide, please. So in terms of discussion, uh, we discussed those pre-1994 patterns and black people uh, and their structural location on the edges of employment. Um, it's black women's labor market status that drives that overall vulnerability. And as you had seen um, in the last slide, the white population um, historically declines. They have resilience to crisis, uh, but interestingly, their uh, status of not economically active is at its lowest level. Um, in the last 15 years post-COVID. And so there's a real sense in which uh, the inequality gap has widened. And that is my timer to say stop. I'm going to take one minute uh, to just introduce the policy implications that we had begun to think about. Um, and so is South Africa in a space where our policy interventions have been interventions light um, and we need to start to be able to do things that are fundamentally different to see the um, labor market restructured. Uh, I think the case is very definitely yes. What we're seeing is that um, policy coordination is urgent. We need research that can inform policymakers on how to do uh, industrial policy well or um, if nothing else less poorly uh, but that we contemporize industrial policy which is to say um, that we need a plural plurality of interventions, um, and we need to focus on export as opposed to uh, particularly just inward-facing um, industrial policy strategies. Industrial policies are not at all uncommon. Uh, if you look at the data, you'll see that the global north wealthy countries, China, employ an enormous amount of industrial policy interventions, and the GDP, um, a substantial share of the GDP goes towards industrial policy. In the long term, in the long term industrial policy is is known to shift resources in the de desired direction, and so we need it, but it also restructures economic activity. Um, we need public-private collaboration, which is to say we move away from a top-down approach in terms of regulation. Um, we need to be able to see uh, customized public services in the way policy is implemented um, versus just purely subsidies as the one-size-fits-all intervention. Um, and two last quick things are the deindustrialization of employment is something we're going to need to reckon with. We're seeing an increased um, level of capitalization um, or capital intensity in industrialization, and it's the services sector that we're going to need to bring to the forefront. It's odd for us as economists to think of industrial policy incorporating services sector, uh, but there is potentially some uh, relief available to us in doing that. Thank you for your patience. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Sharon Lin. Um, um, like we didn't get a question directly for you at the moment, but I did make a note for one uh, towards you. Um, Rex, there is a question for you in the chat in terms of um, what was the motivation for the choice of the two countries, given that they are similar uh, features, i.e. location and country characteristics. Uh, please make a response uh, to that. And then I'll give you the next question. Uh, thanks, Rindani. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, in in Morocco and Tunisia, are generally uh, these the economies are, are generally uh, performing well. Um, maybe not the fastest, I guess, but but they've been resilient over time. Um, I just realized that the there's an uh, index that was recently done by the African Center for Economic Transformation, and their index sort of ranks them uh, 
quite high next to countries like uh, South Africa um, in terms of, you know, uh, being uh, better performing and things like that. Um, but another reason also has to do with their location. You see, they are, they are sort of next to um, markets in Europe, Asia, and that, that gives them the opportunity to benefit from, from knowledge and uh, what you call it, technical spillovers. Right? And even in Morocco, there are several, um, several uh, what you call it, factories of uh, automobile companies and all of, the, all of that technical knowledge and know-how is, is something that benefits the, the domestic economy itself. Uh, and then the overriding consideration also is uh, is about data availability. Right? The, the data for most African countries was not so great, but Morocco and Tunisia seem to have um, um, data for for the time series that we looked at um, in in this case. Right? <clears throat> so so these are these are the considerations uh, for for choosing the two countries. Um, I do have a. I, I had a question along that as well, because I did hear you speaking about the the spillover um, aspect. I mean, as we all know, it's not it's not automatic just because you are next to a certain country that things are going to spill over. Um, was there any way done or just as a comment, how are they facilitating that spillover and the transfer? Because there's effort that you need to do to actually enable the, the spillover and let it contribute. Um, inside the economy. Are you aware of any aspect that they are doing to drive the facilitation of the knowledge uh, and the skills and all of that? Yeah, no, at the moment, at the moment, you know, I mean, I guess to, to be able to answer a question like that, we'll need to sort of do like some uh, dive or case study analysis to, to understand what specifically is happening in Morocco that is, uh, or Tunisia that is uh, contributing to their, their performance in in some of these rankings, but um, the paper didn't focus on any of some of these uh, specific factors. But looking at the secondary data, um, you know, this 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 is the message of or this is the, the understanding behind the the trends in growth performance and and, and their rankings and uh, their rankings among African countries. Uh, um, you know, so yeah, but maybe what you're asking is is uh, something a spin-off can be a spin-off from um, from a study like this. But uh, we we'll definitely need to know uh, a bit more to to be able to to understand this. Yeah, I think it's quite an important piece that as we move our policy recommendations to the how, you know, how should the policy maker move from once they have a second understanding. Um, I think I think that's quite a key aspect that tends to be missing in some of our policy recommendations that they're quite static. They don't necessarily give action in terms of what somebody can go and do or take a lesson. Um, uh, from that perspective. So perhaps that's a consideration and as you said, a spin-off for, for the paper. Next question also from, from Magda is, the models actually predict the long-term growth for the countries, the predict growth rate match the actual growth for the countries, and what are the limitations of the multi-sectoral growth model um, used? If you could perhaps pro provide some responses on, uh, on that, please. Yeah. Um, so I guess the in terms of prediction, um, yeah, we realize that the models actually are predicting quite close to the to the actual um, average growth rates. Um, I showed a table like that, but th they actually predict well. Um, uh, the multi-sectoral one actually much better than much better than the simpler one because you you are accounting for sectoral shares, right? But the challenge with with, with these models um, is is actually being able to estimate the right in, in quotes the right um, income elasticities of demand for inputs and exports because if if you don't get that stage right so if one didn't get that stage right then the model's prediction will actually be be far off than than expected and in order to do that I've come to realize that you actually need to make sure that your 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 models the what do you call it the specification of the error correction model um actually takes into account the uh, structural breaks uh, structural breaks which may have occurred over time that could possibly influence a trend um in 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 the data right? 
So I, I mean, there wasn't enough time to talk about it, but there are some, some additional variables that are included in the ECMs that will sort of capture the structural breaks um, that may have occurred over time and, you know, sort of change that. But by the end of the exercise, by looking at the, the, the prediction, the model's uh, predictability, we realized that the, the elasticity seemed to be seem to be uh, um, to be working fine, um, and and that takes um, that sort of sets the 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 caution that uh, if you're going to estimate, the, uh, you're going to run this type of model, you should be aware that um, some estimates are not reasonable. It may be too high or too low, and that is something that can affect the model's predictability in, in, in the end. Thanks so much. All right. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, it's been confirmed that Idrissa is in the meeting, so we'll go back to presentation number uh, two. Jessica was supposed to call us. Idrissa, please confirm. And then uh, yeah. Rosal. Yeah. Uh, and then, yes, thank you for, for this. Uh, okay. okay. I'm online. <laughs> right. Um, Jose, are you going to share the presentation, Lisa? Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to say it now. Okay, cool. Um, let me do it. Thank so you. So, mode. so our our paper is on um, remittances and industrial development in Africa. So, um, uh, Kizito Jean Bujidrao and uh, Abdul Aziz uh, Abikadi Ahmed are my are my co-authors. I hope they are also online. So uh, we have uh, three points to present, the background and the, and the justification, the methodology and the data, and the result and discussion, okay? So um, um, uh, the, so DEFAN has the growth of the manufacturing sector related to other sector. Um, Initialization is uh, key to economic development of nations. So the strategic importance of industrialization for development uh, stems from the fact that uh, uh, industrial activities, particularly uh, manufacturing, uh, improve labor productivity and, uh, and promotion of technological diff diffusion uh, to, other, to other productive sectors um, are, are important and they help to accelerate economic growth and create um, decent uh, decent jobs. So it, it stimulates technological progress through uh, economies of, of scales. So um, um, a, a central team in the powering of uh, theories of development, uh, this process was then relegated to second place in the wake of the adjustment policies of the late 1980s. So advocated as part of the Washington consensus and structural adjustment policies. So being uh, being uh, before being put back uh, at the at, at the 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 heart of the economic debates and the agenda of public authorities and and institutional uh, and and international institution over the last three decades. So. Um, um, Africa are aware that uh, uh, initialization is important as a driver of development. So they have they, they, they have now started to to develop industrial policies so to to initialize the their 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 countries. So um however after after several several years of implementation, um the policies and strategies that have been put uh, in place have not led to significant uh, changes, okay, because the contribution of African economies to manufacturing value added on the global scale remain uh, low, around 1.66%. Um, uh, so uh, it's low. So, and this uh, low level of uh, value added manufacturing. Uh, sector can be explained to several factors, uh, uh, including uh, limited uh, skills, poor infrastructure, and 
on attractive investment climates and also a lack of uh, necessary investment uh, capital to finance in the solution effectively among among others uh, factors so but in addition to those factors um migrant remittances uh, has also been alerted as one of the determining factors of industrialization. So, uh, and uh, recently, uh, remittances have been uh, increasing. So, the, the average level of remittances in Africa is around 7.9%. Uh, okay. And these remittances are expected to, to rise by 1.9%. Okay. From uh, 2020 to 2022. 2024, according to the World Bank. So, so the growing trend in remittances raises and, and, and also the low level of um, industrialization in Africa uh, raises the following question. So what are the, the, the effects of uh, migrant remittances on industrial development in Africa? So uh, through this question, we, 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 we have specific questions. The first one, what are the, the, the direct effects of remittances on industrial development in Africa? Do the direct effects, do, do this effect depend on the, on the level of human capital accumulation in African countries? That, in other words, is human capital a moderating effect of um, uh, uh, remittances and industrial development in Africa? Are there threshold effects of migrant remittances on initial development in Africa? So these are our main questions. We have not, uh, particularly the second one and the third one have not been raised in, in previous or uh, previous work. So um but remittances can affect um initial development through three effects, three tunnels. The first one is the spending uh, effect. So this just shows that remittances can stimulate growth in the manufacturing sector, uh, giving the additional demand they, they generate and the associated uh, multiplier effects. It can also, it can also increase um, uh, in relation to employment. So by increasing uh, income flows to recipient households, uh, remittances can disrupt the trade-off between work and leisure in favor of uh, Increased le leisure. Uh, the third effect is on in, in investment. So remittances generally to increase demand for investment in housing, which is likely to stimulate demand for building materials and consequently um, the manufacturing sector. Um, so um, uh, it can also lead to uh, appreciation of the exchange rates, uh, which can have a uh, negative effects on the 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 exports the export uh, level and then uh, the manufacturing uh, sector so we we use uh, many methods we use the pool OLS or as time 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 effects which is required the GMM the two step GMM the system and the the, the counter regressions so we use annual data this which uh, um cover of, 50 countries in Africa over the period 1996-2020. So the data are from the World Bank. Um, so uh, from this figure, we can see that there is a negative uh, uh, correlation between uh, remittances and uh, industrial development. Okay, um, Countries which have a uh, uh, low um level of remittances tend to have higher level of industrial development okay so um our regression also show that in fact um remittances has negative effects on um, on um, uh, industrial development okay um so this is shown by uh, those two tables and also uh these uh, negative effects um, is is higher in in countries um, uh, with a high level of uh, industrial um, development. So, um, with the interaction effects, uh, we saw that um, 
um, human capital uh, measured by tertiary education uh, moderates uh, the level of uh, uh, the negative effects of uh, of remittances on industrial development. So up to now, we have not yet uh, determined um, uh, at which level uh, uh, human capital can can even cancel uh, the negative effect of uh, remittances on industrial development, but we will we, we, we'll, uh, we'll do that to, to include the paper. When we try to look at uh, household effects, um, so we use uh, the key fits, key fits and the lowest, and, and we saw that there is a, um, a U-shape, a U-shape relationship between uh, um, limitancies and uh, industrial development. And um, and uh, from uh, 20, 20, around 23% you know, of uh, remittances, um, uh, we start seeing, we start observing a uh, positive, uh, positive effect of uh, remittances on industrial development. So showing that there is uh, a threshold effect uh, between uh, remittances and industrial development. So um to but let, to summarize remittances have a negative effect on industrial development in africa this negative effect is more important in countries with high level of industrialization and this negative effect is is moderated or mitigated by uh, human capital accumulation particularly uh, tertiary education and also, um, there is threshold effect of remittances estimated at uh, around 23% of GDP, from which uh, its uh, effect on initial development becomes um, positive. So there are uh, some policy implications. Uh, uh, first of all, um, when we calculate the average, the, the average, the mean of uh, remittances of all African countries in the sample, we see that the level of remittance is still uh, low, is still low, uh, except for uh, Lesotho, which is, which is having um, uh, remittances higher than the, 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 the transport effects. So uh, this means that a country should, 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 uh, should increase, should, should uh, increase the, 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 the amount of uh, remittances to, to encourage people to to send more um, uh, remittances uh, to to their countries and um, um, direct uh, uh, those uh, remittances to uh, human capital uh, um, development. Okay, so policymakers need to review remittances policies in countries where the negative effect is more pronounced. Also, perhaps by limiting the amount of remittances in, uh, uh, or, by, or making them uh, conditional on human capital investment in the initial uh, sectors. So we will we'll, we'll, uh, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, suggest that they increase, the, they increase uh, the level of remittances and then uh, direct it uh, towards uh, human capital um, development. They could also consider diversifying the sources of financing to reduce uh, the excessive reliance on foreign remittances, or uh, particularly uh, domestic resources, uh, 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 they should look for domestic resources because dependence uh, is, is 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 always bad. So to this end, it's necessary for these countries to strengthen uh, infrastructure and capacity uh, in the industrial and manufacturing sectors to encourage economic growth. And to and to reduce our dependence on on limitancies, also investing in education and vocational training to improve the skills and qualification of the workforce would also facilitate the creation of a more skilled workforce uh, adapted to the needs of industry and an increase of business or productivity. So this is a uh, the preliminary uh, the, the first draft of the paper. So we need to uh, go deeper and then uh, improve it. So uh, I, I would thank you for, for your kind attention. All right, uh, thank you very, very much, Idrissa, um, for the 
for the presentation. Um, I've been informed that Charles is not, unless I've got a latest message from Rosel, but informed that Charles is not um, um, available. I'm going to check if there's a new um, question in here. Uh, yeah, I think there is a question from um, uh, Magda. Uh, she seems to be filled in this last uh, session in terms of questions. Uh, she wants some clarification on the connection and underpinning between remittances. Given that remittances are mainly spent on consumption and not investment, I think links to that as well. You mentioned a policy uh, recommendation in the end on investment in education, which for me, investment in education do a lot of things in the economy. How do you link it up now here to the remittance? Because I think we need to, you know, if we're to help policymakers, we need to be able to isolate these things so that they are clear. Otherwise, you invest in education and many things happen, but how do you link it back to the, to the remittances? So I think this question is linked to my uh, question as well. If you can just bring that together so there's clarity around the linkages or some correlations that you're bringing forward and uh, on that on that front. Well, thank you for, for this. Um, yeah, the theoretical connections uh, and the pinning between the maintenances and industrial development. So we have seen in the literature that um, um, remittances can affect uh, uh, industrial development through uh, many channels. Uh, we have highlighted uh, the, the the investment channel, um, say, with uh, yeah, people can also use remittances to, to, to invest, to invest in housing, uh, to invest in um, uh, medium enterprises, and and also uh, in in uh, in in, in other aspect of uh, development, yeah, they can also use it to 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 consume, to consume. You know, um, many countries now have tried are trying to 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 encourage um, uh, people, uh, particularly from the diaspora, to to invest uh, to to invest uh, uh, in the economies. Uh, particularly in, uh, in reducing uh, taxes uh, and the cost of remittances. Uh, uh, so I think if there is clear policy how to, to, to direct uh, remittances, uh, uh, they can help uh, to increase uh, the demand, um, the, the demand, the, the supply, uh, uh, the, 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 the demand of goods and, and services, uh, the, yeah, the, the supply also, I think uh, it can help to curb uh, the, the negative effect of remittances uh, uh, on uh, initial um, development. So that's what I can see for now. Okay, thanks. I, I, I do have uh, one question for, for Sharon Lin. When I look at the data that you presented, it appears to confirm the lack of structural a transformation in or or just the trans not necessarily structural transformation but the transformation of the economy seems to tell us that things are still you know where they were even pre nineteen ninety four from a labor dynamics point of view is that a is that a correct ass um, uh, assessment that is quite correct and I think um, one of the things that stood out in presenting this research to a, a group in the no global north is that. Um, if you take a look at economies like America, for instance, a, a black woman is clearly in the minority. Um, and so unemployment, uh, using that example, is still bad. But we live in a country I where black women are the majority. And 30 years into democracy, we have a raft of policy um, that just is not shaking the roots and creating a fundamentally different reality in terms of livelihoods, access to the economy. And so it begs questions around um, what our policy implementation can and should look like um, 
and whether we need a more contemporary set of policy instruments. We certainly need coordination, what's happening with competition policy, public interest considerations, for instance, and gender being made a reality. So we're at the, at the edge of being able to perhaps begin to apply those kinds of things, uh, but trade policy, subsidies, um, a whole raft of, of interventions that are localized and that have contextual relevance is really now important. We need to take bigger risks. As an example, um, a lot of the global north is making catalytic investment in clean energy. Um, and in terms of our proportionate commitment to that, uh, I think we were perhaps missing uh, a few beats, specifically in women's participation in the production of clean energy. Um, and so I would love to see a, a, a very different attitude uh, towards industrial policy that, that gives us a chance of having a different set of outcomes that the data can bear another 30 years from now. Okay, yeah, no, I, I found that quite interesting. I said when I looked at it, it was just mirrored. It was a mirror from that perspective. So it, it's good to uh, go here that that's part of the, of the view. Um, Rex, there was no, I've already asked you my question, so there was no further questions in the in the chat, and I don't see any hand. I think with that being said, I want to say thanks to to you, Rex, uh, to Sherlyn, and also for Idrisa for coming in unplanned. <laughs> we really appreciate that. And yeah, um, mm -hmm. I see an informed uh, Saul will uh, close out the session. So I will now hand back uh, uh, to Saul, uh, the main driver, to conclude uh, the day. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Thanks very Thanks much. So much. Um, and um, yeah, thank you to everyone. This is our closing session. Um, so I'm just going to do a very short closing. Um, and I'm just to thank the presenters, the moderators, um, the TIPS team who've been involved in the background. Um, assisting with all the logistics around organizing a virtual conference, um, which the technology uh, mostly got right. But um, I think we, we've, um, you know, re really need to thank them for pulling it all together. To our scientific committee for a board for the guidance that they give, um, not only to um, this event, but also for the award program um, and making sure that we um, have a robust um, program. Um, and importantly, to the participants uh, for your for joining us for the active engagement um, and looking at the the interesting content that our presenters have shared with us. Um, I, I found the presentations and discussions today were uh, really insightful. They add to our thinking, and they've been on a range of different topics. Um, we we've looked at different countries, different issues. And it uh, highlights the diversity of thinking that we need um, in order to get industrial development right um, and the different ideas and um, the importance of having these conversations. It's also been useful to connect with colleagues from across, across the continent in today's conference. It could have been a much bigger conference, but we, we needed to balance um, the, the virtual element with, with um, trying to um, you know, have a, an event that's um, easy to engage with. So we, we've come up with a, a format um, that um, hopefully is, is useful. Um, we, we have an evaluation um, form that we'll send to everyone um, so that we can look at where we need to improve um, and the approach that we should take. Should we make it a whole day? Should it be longer? Would people be prepared to stay online for longer? Or could we even look at um, something in person um, and, and whether that's viable? So uh, we are looking at um, having future events. I think it's been a very successful morning and thank everyone for their involvement. Um, just as a, as a, a public service announcement, it's the um, APORD and RPPM call that will be coming out soon. Um, so we'll send it um, to our database and ask if you can circulate it to your networks um, so that we, we have a, a, a group applying again to, to come for the training in September. Um, and with that, um, we've come to the end of our conference. And thank you, everyone, for joining and participating. Thanks.